that's exactly for in Cairo. It's time for Word of Info. Hello and welcome. This is Word of Info. I'm Mohammed at the controls. I'm Najla Nagib and with you, Dr. Amr Mabrouk, Professor of Plastic Surgery at Ain Shams University. And we'll be with you until 4 o'clock, until 5 o'clock. So stay with us. This is Word of Info. And today we have our distinguished guest, His Excellency Ambassador Noki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan in Egypt. Good afternoon. Pleasure to have you with us. It's a great pleasure to have with us His Excellency Ambassador Noki Masaki, the Ambassador of Japan in, in, in Cairo. And really, we are really grateful that you had the time to come to our radio program to talk to the Egyptian population about Japan. Ambassador uh, Noki Masaki has a great experience as uh, as an ambassador and as a diplomat in the Japanese government. He worked as the ambassador in the first resident ambassador in Djibouti. He worked in France. He worked in the Ministry of of, uh, of uh, Foreign Service in, ja in Japan for quite a long time with a degree in law and international law. He's the right man to represent uh, Japan here in Egypt, especially that uh, the year 2020 will be such an important year for uh, Japan-Egypt uh, bilateral relationship. We'll see two huge events in, in, in 2020. One is Tokyo 2020 Olympic Paralympic, and the other one, of course, is the opening up of uh, the Grand Egyptian Museum, which is Japan has uh, graciously uh, contributed a lot into its building, in its ideas, and in the, the fact that it's going to be a very high-tech museum uh, to a very old uh, civilization. So uh, a combination and a memorable year we thought that uh, no better one to discuss the Egyptian-Japanese relations and the and the prospect of its improvement and its uh, flourishing, but His Excellency Ambassador Noki Masaki, <coughs> Ambassador of Japan in Cairo. Sir, thank you very much for taking the time and coming to our program. Thank you for giving me the occasion to talk to, to the Egyptian people. It's a great pleasure. And uh, when we talk about Japan, Egyptians would like to refer to it as uh, the other planet. <laughs> Not <laughs> quite. <laughs> <laughs> they always say that the Japanese people are uh, very meticulous, the Japanese people are well informed, the Japanese people do uh, everything to perfection. And uh, we have uh, to trace that. Uh, by giving some short uh, resume about the history of Japan. Sometimes people understand that Japan is only post-war, post-1945 war, and that before <coughs> the war, uh, Japan uh, was not uh, that advanced, was not that, uh, people were not that highly educated, the history is not that, uh, because, of course, this is false information. Uh, people don't know much about Japan, so for them this is blank. But Japan has a great history. A history of a civilization, history of progress, and the history of traditions. That mixing the tradition with uh, with progress is a, a very uh, a difficult combination. That Japan Japanese people were mastering it all through the years, from the 12th century until 1868. Japan was ruled by successive feudal milit military shoguns in the name of the emperor. Japan entered into a long period of isolation in the early 17th century, which only ended in 1853. So, what brought the isolation? I mean, I know that Japan, before the, the Portuguese came, uh, was not very much known to the European civilization. But mm -hmm. this does not mean that Japan was a backward country, no. Mm -hmm. It was a country that was having trade with China and was trading with the local neighbors. And uh, the entrance of the Portuguese as traders, as partners in trade, mm -hmm. uh, started, uh, broke the isolation of Japan mm -hmm. in considering isolation to the uh, West. But in, in the 70, early 17th century, the Japanese decided that we are going to be isolated, we're going to build a wall. Why was that? Well, uh, it's generally said that isolationist policy uh, covers the period from 1639 to 1854. Uh, it was uh, to uh, basically uh, protect uh, Japan from negative influence from the Western powers. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that time, uh, an eminent uh, war warlord, Ieyasu, succeeded in unifying the country after a century of difficult, uh, conflictual time. Mm. And he, he was uh, leading a uh, 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 very ordered uh, government, uh, which was called the Bakufu government. Uh, but one um, serious concern uh, was the uh, Christian missionaries, mm -hmm. especially from Portugal. Uh, Portugal was uh, not only propagating the religion, 
but uh, it had a very political ambition. Mm. At that time, Portugal and Spain were competing all over the world for enlarging their sphere of influence. Mm. So uh, the, the certain uh, warlords in Japan, uh, which became uh, Christian, were considered as uh, a potential rebel uh, from the central government of Bakufu. Mm. And the Bakufu decided to prohibit the Christianity and the arrival of foreign ships from abroad. And this was the beginning of the isolation. Mm. But actually, uh, he, Bakufu uh, kept an uh, open window uh, so that uh, they could selectively uh, have a trade and receive uh, information and technique, especially uh, from the Netherlands, mm. which was a Protestant country and uh, which was thought to be more benign compared with uh, the, Catholic, the Catholic, Catholic yeah, power. Yes, of course. So, uh, 200 years uh, of isolation, uh, you might think that um, isolation is not good for the development. Actually, it was a period of relative peace and prosperity. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that isolation uh, period, we uh, introduced a limited, uh, selective uh, positive information from the West and uh, developed uh, economy, politics and culture. So, uh, traditional dances, songs, poems, and so on, which are still familiar for us uh, today. Mm. So that was a period of prosperity. But still, 200 years were a bit too long, and the world changed. Mm. And in the uh, 19th century, there was a so-called Industrial Revolution. Mm. Uh, Western powers came, especially in 1853. The United States sent five powerful uh, steel ships, yes, and they uh, threatened us to open the door for commerce, and they were followed by European powers like the UK, France, uh, and Russia. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, we were uh, obliged to uh, open the country. So uh, it's an trade. open open gate policy that started in 1853, more or less. Uh, yes, we are obliged to go for uh, the the open relations, but still, how to deal with the Western powers? continue to be the biggest political issue in Japan. And of course, since we are talking about that, in 1863-64, there was a very interesting mission. The mission uh, of, uh, of uh, samurai, who are uh, Japanese gentlemen and very high tech or uh, very important technocrat in the, in the hierarchy and the service of the government, of the Japanese government, they were given the task to travel uh, to France, uh, which was considered to be a more or less a benign partner to negotiate with the with the French and with the people of the West to bring back isolation <laughs> <laughs> ten years later. Mm -hmm. And on their way this expedition went by, as you have told me before that off air, to visit all the the countries on their way, but uh, they stopped in a very uh, peaceful country at that time mm -hmm. with great progress mm -hmm. and they were very much interested to see everything about it and that is Egypt. So tell us about this first encounter, sir. Yes, so uh, it happened during the time when we were still uh, going back and forth <coughs> about opening opening the door. Uh, so even after opening the door to the Western power in the 1850s, uh, there was uh, an instruction coming from the Imperial House, try to close uh, the door again. <laughs> and the, uh, this mission uh, that you mentioned was tasked to negotiate with France uh, to uh, close the biggest port near Tokyo, Yokohama. Mm. And uh, with that mission impossible, mm -hmm. uh, they took a, a ship and uh, went all the way from uh, Japan to uh, Europe. And uh, on their way, they stopped at the Suez and uh, took a train to Cairo and then to Alexandria. Mm. But uh, uh, before that uh, difficult mission, they were very much looking forward to uh, visit uh, an extraordinary site. Mm. And they called Triangle Mountains and uh, Head Head Hill, mm. so which means uh, pyramids and Sphinx. And Sphinx. <laughs> uh, we know very well about this mission because uh, 10 of the uh, members uh, left a diary about this uh, uh, incredible experience. The mission was led by a young samurai of 28 years old mm. and the members were 34 
from 70 years old to uh, 44 years old. But it was given the, the leadership was given to a young samurai. Young samurai. Why oh, is that? Well, he, he has a, he ha he comes from a very uh, uh, strong uh, family, so his uh, uh, rank was high, although uh, the age was young. But he was a wise man, and he, he proved to be a good leader. Uh, more or less, more or less so. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. Uh, and the, the, they decide they, they were they stayed in Cairo for seven days, and in the middle uh, they they took a horse car uh, to the uh, west. They go to the Nile, uh, took a sailor ship, and then after that they uh, jumped on donkeys and uh, continued the way uh, to the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And uh, among the 34, there were only 27 uh, who participated in the trip because seven, uh, s some of them caught cold. Mm -hmm. In April, they were not very prepared. The, the difference of temperature uh, in the morning and uh, during the night was, uh, during the day was very, <laughs> very big. And uh, some of them caught cold. But anyway, uh, uh, 27 went to <coughs> the pyramid, and uh, some of them climbed un up to the top of the pyramids, and some of them even entered into uh, the pyramids. And then uh, they went before the Sphinx and uh, took a photo. Yes. The photographer was an Italian, uh, Antonio Beato, who, who was living in Cairo at that time. Mm. And the nice thing about this photo is that I had the honor in visiting the Egyptian embassy in Tokyo and I found a copy of this photograph and in the office of the ambassador there there is a copy and I believe also in Japan in the house of the ambassador there is a copy of this photograph and a copy of it in your office sir, as well. Exactly. So this, mm. this really shows how far mm. the, the connection and the, the pride in the relation, right mm. sir? So this is the first Japanese tourist to, <laughs> to Egypt <laughs> and uh, they mark uh, the, the beginning of uh, friendly ties between Japan and Egypt. Yes, and as you said that uh, this was mission impossible mm -hmm. and the failure was doomed but Japan came out victorious after this isolation policy because uh, the Empire of Japan was proclaimed in 1868, the Emperor was a divine symbol of the nation and in the late 19th and early 20th century victories in the first Sino-Japanese War, the, the, uh, the Russian-Japanese War and World War I allowed Japan to expand its empire during a period of increased militarism. The second uh, Chinese-Japanese War of 37 expanded into part of the World War II in 1941, which came to an end in 1945. So, after the end of the war, Japan has been following the way of peace-loving nation. How can we explain the, the rise and the fall of, of, of this militarism period, I mean, from 1868 till 1945? So, so it's, a, it's a bit long period, but mm. uh, during that time, uh, I should say that building a strong state was the only way to keep the independence. And unfortunately, we went too far. Yes. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's roughly 80, 80 years, and the uh, yeah. first 50 years up to the end of World War II, World War I, yes. 1990, it was uh, a relatively coordinated policy period. Yes. But the last 30 years uh, uh, from the end of the World War I to until the end of World War II was a more dividing and uh, adventurous policy period. Yes. Uh, during the first uh, uh, 50 years, uh, we saw that the Western powers were colonizing and exploiting weaker countries one by one. And we had a strong sense of crisis, mm -hmm. and the patriots led the nation to modernize the system, enrich the country, and strengthen the military. And immediate uh, threat came from the North, forces exerting uh, influence for, uh, to the especially to the Korean Peninsula. And in this context, Japan fought wars with China in 1894 and 10 years later with Russia in 1904. The world was uh, surprised by Japan's victory, such a small island winning over enormous countries. And uh, Japan continued the industri industrialization, reinforced the military force, 
and expanded its interests abroad and carried out skillful diplomacy, including the development of the alliance with the United King Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And Japan became among winners of World War I. Mm -hmm. But after the World War I, the world changed a bit. Uh, that devastate, mm -hmm. World I devastated Europe, and the world uh, entered into a short period of peace and disarmament. Mm -hmm. Uh, Japanese diplomacy also looked f for consultation, but a part of Japan's army, uh, what we call the Canton Army, deployed in China at that time, began to ignore the government concerted policy and take more and more aggressive and provo provocative actions. And in Japan, too, uh, radical uh, rights, including young militaries, uh, became agitated and inflamed the public sentiments. So under, uh, against this background, through the 1930s, uh, aggressive actions, Japanese aggressive actions in China, gradually uh, isolated again Japan mm -hmm. from uh, the international community. And uh, But Japan agreed uh, to have a good relation with Germany and Italy, composing uh, acts of three countries. When the World War II began uh, in 1939 and Germany began occupying various parts of Europe, Japanese army uh, took advantage of the situation and sent troops to the south and intervened in French Indochina, mm -hmm. mainly today's Vietnam. And this invited the United States to impose economic sanctions against Japan. Mm. And they demanded Japan to withdraw from China, China and abrogate the German-Italian-Japanese tripartite pact. Before this uh, strong demand from the US, Japanese government was divided um, among those who support continued negotiations and those uh, who uh, would like to launch war. And in the end, Japan conducted a surprise attack uh, against the U.S., so-called Pearl Harbor attack in Hawaii. And on December 8, 1941, uh, the Asia-Pacific War began. Yes. At first, Japanese army quickly occupied the South Pacific area, but the U.S. became more and more predominant and the Japanese uh, military destroyed more and more, and the economy uh, deteriorated, and cities bombarded, and finally atomic bombs were used against Hiroshima on August 8, and then on Nagasaki August 9, in 1945. And Japan surrendered, accepting the so-called Potsdam Declaration. And Japan had to restart from Auschwitz. After the war, uh, the general headquarters of the Allied powers promoted Japan's demilitarization and democratization. And in 1947, Japanese new constitution was enacted. And its Article 9, so-called peace article, stipulates that aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. So this article shows uh, the new orientation of Japanese uh, attitude toward the international community. So now we reach a very important period that everybody is aware of but doesn't know much about its details. And I think after the break we have to bring out the resurrection <coughs> of Japan after World War II. A country that has been, uh, uh, two, two major cities have been demolished by atomic bombs, the only country in the world uh, which was subjected to atomic uh, bombing, and at the same time a lot of its cities and a lot of its industries were brought to rebels. But miraculously, Japan rised, has uh, rised again, has rose again from the rebels like a phoenix, as they always say. But I don't think it was a phoenix, I think there's another secret. So after the break with His Excellency, Ambassador Noki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan in Cairo,
we have to continue the talk. So back again, word of info with His Excellency, Ambassador Noki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan in Egypt, Dr. Amr Mabrouk, Professor of Plastic Surgery at Anshams University. So in 1945, as we were just discussing after the war, uh, the, the nation was partially destroyed or semi-destroyed, and yet there was still the secret, the secret of success, the secret of resurrection, was not just the money that the, the Allies brought in, or the victorious brought in to save Japan from going into communism, but still Japan was able to get a resurrection. How was that resurrection possible? Was it only the Marshall's project or the, 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 the MacArthur uh, doctrine to, to try to, to give money for the Japanese to build up their mm -hmm. economy? Mm -hmm. Or there was another secret? Tell us about the secret of success. Sir. Well, it's not secret, but I would say it was due to peace and education, two words. Mm -hmm. Well, when the war ended, uh, the country was not partial, but it really reduced to ashes, and the people were under shock. And there was uh, also a period of social instability, uh, but uh, gradually the people uh, moved toward uh, reconstruction. And people's conviction was the war devastated the country, we should never again engage in wars as uh, that mind is reflected in the Article 9 of the Constitution, Peace Article. The people worked hard for development. It was the same as in the 19th century when we opened the country against the Western powers. But the difference is uh, we have been working after the Second World War II only through peaceful means. That's the difference. And the need of education was reiterated. It has always been important uh, in Japan, but uh, uh, it became even more important. Uh, when I was a child, uh, war had been over many years before. I was often told uh, by teachers and by my parents, we lost everything. The only thing left is the human resources. So we have to work hard, much harder than the Americans do. So the education was the most important means for the development of the country, as well as, as, well as for individuals to realize their personal promotion in the society. Of course, Japan's exceptional high growth was not possible only by the efforts by the individuals. It was uh, very important, uh, the government policy and international environment. Uh, Japanese government pursued a sound economic policy and a peaceful uh, diplomacy. The government built infrastructure, encouraged capital investment, and to introduced uh, advanced technology. For example, uh, Japan developed a world fastest train in 1964 with a speed of 200 kilometers per hour at that time already using the World Bank loan to connect uh, Tokyo and the second city Osaka to be ready in the year of the first Tokyo Olympic in 1964. And uh, generally Japan imported raw, material, raw materials and energy, uh, added value to them through manufacturing and exported them to foreign markets, especially to the United States. And also Japan promoted peace diplomacy with an alliance with the United States to deter any attack against Japan during the difficult period of the Cold War. As a consequence, during the period of 20 years from 1953 to 73, a miracle period, economy grew at 10% per year and the GDP uh, became three times larger and Japan became the second largest economy in the world just after the United States in 1968. Hmm. So, uh, when we're talking about the metrics of prosperity, such as Human Development Index, the Japanese population enjoys the highest life expectancy of any country in the world, and the infant mortality rate being the third lowest globally. This means that it has a perfect health care system. Uh, as you told us, sir, that the investment in education was very high, especially after the war, to change the whole system of education, to promote the technological way of education. And the second important point was taking care of the health of the population. Mm -hmm. How was that possible to bring in 
the improvement of the health system after the war? Well, uh, actually, Japan achieved universal health coverage as early as in 1961 with the introduction of the health insurance for all Japanese. And uh, this did not suddenly begin after the war, but uh, there were, had been a constant effort for uh, developing the health care system, partly in order to have a good uh, uh, military force, for well, good military force, uh, health was also important. Yes. There was that motivation. After the World War II, the motivation was very different. Uh, for the economic development, healthcare system was uh, important. And uh, as quickly as 1961, we, uh, we, uh, we did that. And this was the basis, at the basis of social and economic development, as well as the longevity and uh, low infant mortality. Uh, universal health coverage means everybody can enjoy health and medical service without uh, suffering from economic difficulty. It is not only the access to services, but the quality of the services is also uh, important. Not all, not all countries, including rich countries, adopt the universal health insurance system, but we believe it is important and we emphasize its importance sharing our experience and resources with other countries. When we talk about health, we have to give a mention to another uh, arm of success of the of the the, the giant uh, com uh, companies in Japan was the extreme loyalty between employees and the employing company. Usually, an employer employee would go in at the very young age to to serve his company, and the company will give him loyalty back. Uh, and this uh, bilateral loyalty has g gone on for uh, tens of years, especially after the war. How far is this uh, true on the economy of today? Have the, uh, the social media and the opening up of the society changed the, the young people of Japan? Or it is still the same that the, the generation of their fathers and our generation are still uh, uh, inflicted on the, on the younger generations uh, to stay loyal in their companies or in their employment? Mm. Well, uh, you have already your answer. <laughs> well, loyalty between the company and the employees has been Japan's characteristics, and it still is compared to uh, in other countries, but it is changing. Uh, typical working relations in Japan used to be uh, one employee works in the same company during the entire career, lifetime employment was guaranteed, and the promotion was according to the seniority. Employees stayed long hours at the workplace, and even after the work, they gathered together and went out to drink and eat together, and the company was like a second home. It was the case until probably until uh, the 1980s, but the situation began to change uh, gradually. It became more difficult for companies to guarantee lifetime employment. Company, companies themselves uh, live shorter, especially in service sectors, and in particular in information technology. And people pay more attention to the balance between work and life. The society is changing, and not every Japanese is the same. We are all looking for various work style and the lifestyle that make us feel happy for each of us. So uh, the situation is more diverse than before. Mm. But this gives us another point. So as we go through uh, the different parts of, of the, the loyalty and the education, we have to maintain that it has Japan was able in its foreign policy to maintain strong effective ties with the whole world and remain as a main player in the political arena. Yet this happened without having any strong dominant armed forces like other superpowers. How was that possible? It's not very easy. <laughs> uh, if you see uh, the map, uh, we have borders, well, maritime borders with Russia and China. And the Korean Peninsula is only 50 kilometers from uh, Tsushima Islands. 
In addition, Japan is a long archipelago of about 3,000 uh, kilometers long and uh, with 6,800 islands. And we do not have much natural resources and especially we have to import almost 100% of petrol and gas, mostly from the Middle East. And we have to export the manufactured products abroad. So on the one hand, it is not an easy task to guarantee its, uh, its security. And on the other hand, we need an international environment which is open and safe. So we have to be very wise and active and efficient in diplomacy. First of all, uh, we have an alliance with the United States and a network of allies and friendly nations such as India, Australia, and the uh, European Union. And then, on the other hand, we have to enhance relations with neighboring countries such as China, Russia and Korea. Based on those two big pillars, uh, we develop a, a comprehensive and multilateral uh, diplomacy, um, economic diplomacy, uh, addressing global issues, and we contribute uh, especially to the peace and stability of the Middle East. And we, we, we have a, a large vision and strategy of a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, taking into consideration our specific geographical situation as a uh, maritime country. And to do all this, uh, we have to have a panoramic view, a panoramic perspective of the world, back, world map, and actively or proactively contribute to peace. And leading uh, this uh, foreign policy line, our Prime Minister Shinzo Abe himself uh, is very active and he has already visited uh, 78 countries and regions himself. So this is how uh, we try to uh, guarantee our uh, safety, uh, security and prosperity. But it's not an easy task. Japan is uh, taking roles, more roles now, in peacekeeping forces all over the world. And uh, uh, last week we have seen uh, the deployment of a Japanese frigate in the, uh, in the Gulf, uh, in the Arab Gulf. And uh, we know, of course, that this is the route or the survival route for Japanese economy, that is the uh, oil and gas that comes from uh, this area and the, uh, and the Gulf area uh, to Japan. So. Uh, how can you explain uh, this, uh, as, as you have just mentioned, it's a very difficult task to be walking on a rope, an extended rope, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. between uh, on top of a fire or on top of uh, uh, deep situations and you are able to manage. Uh, this peacekeeping uh, frigate is going to be a peacekeeping frigate, it's not going to be an aggressive one, but at the same time it has to maintain the security and safety of navigation. So this is uh, very difficult, right? You, you're right. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, mission composed of one destroyer and uh, probably two uh, maritime patrol aircrafts, P-3C, uh, would cover a very limited uh, maritime zone. Mm. It's uh, south, it's not inside uh, the uh, Strait of Hormuz or near the Strait of uh, Babel Mandeb. Mm. It covers from the Gulf of Aden, uh, Arabic Sea, and Oman Gulf. Mm. And the mission is uh, information gathering, mm. uh, information related to the safety of navigation for Japanese ships. Mm. Uh, actually, uh, there are lots of Japan related ships. Uh, roughly 3,900 Japanese-related ships going through the uh, Strait of Homs mm. uh, every year, and 1,900 Japan-related ships going through Babel Mandeb. Mm. Uh, so this is a very important uh, uh, sea lines of communication. And for your information, we had already been uh, working since uh, 2009 uh, in, in the, the fight against piracy, 
uh, in the Gulf of Aden, and the uh, the the ocean uh, uh, in front of uh, of Somali. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, uh, for to to cope with the piracy, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, state uh, actors. So it's a bit different, but uh, uh, we have been pre present mm -hmm. uh, already for some time, and uh, with the sending of uh, these uh, destroyers and uh, uh, patrol aircrafts, uh, we hope uh, we should have uh, better information about the situation and uh, uh, share those uh, useful information with the, the ships navigating in their area, and uh, that would increase the safety of navigation. Of course, that's very understandable. So I think we, uh, we in this interesting talk, we have uh, to shift in the last part of our uh, program for today with His Excellency Ambassador Noki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan in Cairo, about uh, the flourishing Egyptian-Japanese relations after the break. Stay with us, please. Yes. Back again, word of info, and you can call us at 2578-9407. Yes, back again, word of info, with His Excellency Ambassador Noki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan in Egypt, and Dr. Amr Rook, Professor Classic Sergei at Enchamps University. Well, it's a great pleasure uh, to have with us uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, and we're talking now about Egyptian-Japanese relations. We have talked about the first mission of the samurai to Egypt, and the famous picture, and the famous involvement, and uh, and how far we have reaching even uh, the people of Japan have come here individual basis. Uh, the, these were the first tourists, but uh, as I have seen in the Egyptian bo uh, book fair, uh, other books about Japanese uh, travelers to the Middle East, including, for example, Tokotomi Luka, the famous uh, uh, writer and poet, uh, Japanese poet, has written his experience in vi uh, visit to Middle East, including with great emphasis about Egypt as well. But we have to talk about the recent uh, encounter. Uh, as you have just were kind uh, enough to tell us about the number of ships or Japanese-related ships that crossed the, cro the, the Babel Mandeb uh, and, of course, the Suez Canal uh, both ways, almost 1,000 ships per, uh, per year. 1,900. 1,900, yes. yes. <laughs> but some of them go together, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so the others would cross the Suez Canal. And, of course, the, this huge number of uh, ships. But we are talking about the, the projects that have touched the hearts of the Egyptians. And I believe one of these uh, very dear projects to me was the Cairo Opera House. Uh, the Cairo Opera House has been here in Egypt since 1983-84, and it was a beautiful place in the middle of, of Cairo, on the Gezira, on the Zamalek uh, island, and yet everybody has visited the opera. Every person in Egypt definitely has gone to the opera, whether this was for uh, seeing Omar Khayyad, as we were discussing, or the classical, uh, or the the classical uh, concerts, the pop concerts, the famous singers, everybody passed by the opera since 1984, and everybody who passes by the opera house will see on the walls that this has been uh, an Egyptian-Japanese uh, connection. Tell us about this and mm -hmm. your, your feelings about the Egyptian-Japanese relations. Sir. Well, Cairo Bear House is a good example and a symbol of friendship between Japan and Egypt. And for me personally, an oasis in this busy town of Cairo. Uh, Cairo Opera House was uh, inaugurated in 1988, so we just had 30th anniversary, mm. through Japan's grant assistance. And uh, fr as a matter of fact, it was a bit controversial in Japan because we had never done such a large-scale grant assistance in culture. Mm. The grants were usually for uh, human basic needs such as health, primary education, humanitarian assistance, and so on. But in the end, we are happy to be part of this important cultural base. And I was told by many Egyptians how they are grateful of this cooperation, even referring to the opening ceremony in 1988 yes. with the presentation of uh, Kabuki <laughs> and uh, Dance No. Mm. And uh, I hope uh, Egyptians continue to remember the symbol of our cooperation. Mm. And it became also a place uh, to demonstrate to Japanese culture, Japanese traditional dance, drums and films, as well as classic music players uh, performed uh, from Japan. And during the 30th anniversary of uh, 2018, 
opera Aida was played uh, with its title role played by a Japanese soprano and it was at that time I, I, I happened to know uh, Mr. Omar Hayat uh, mm -hmm. who was one of the uh, spectators. Mm -hmm. And of course when we talk about Cairo Opera ah, House... Yes, yes, and uh, let me add that there are uh, musicians uh, working in Cairo Symphony mm -hmm. and uh, Opera House Orchestra and in the Cairo Ballet Company there are 10 Japanese dancers. Mm -hmm. So I hope those Japanese musicians and dancers will continue to be the bridge between Japan and Egypt. Yes, and really I'm a big fan of the Cairo Symphony or Orchestra and I'm a frequent visitor to their concerts every Saturday and I was having the pleasure of seeing and observing the Japanese players over there. So, uh, talking about the mega projects, one of the very dear projects to me, although I am I'm, uh, belonging to Ain Shams University as a professor of plastic surgery there, but I always uh, feel a lot of envy that uh, you have built a beautiful hospital to Cairo University, Abu Rish, and uh, as they call it, the Abu Rish, the Japanese Abu Rish, they always refer to it, the J or the Japanese hospital, or the, uh, familiarly, all the, the Egyptian uh, patients would say, I'm going to Abu Rish al Yabani, and this is really uh, very nice, uh, touching the hearts of the Egyptians. And this hospital has been celebrating many years of work and recently I've known that Japan has got involved more into the improvement of the service and building other annexes for the for this hospital as a big central hospital or referral for pediatric population. Tell us about that, sir. Well, well the hospital, uh, which is familiarly called the Japanese hospital, was built and uh, rehabilitated through Japanese grant assistance of in total 19 million U US dollars. And we have also sent uh, in total 200 experts during the period of 20 years and uh, it is uh, it has become a core hospital for children offering good quality medical service at a low cost uh, but uh, it has become very much crowded um, and uh, they need to extend so we have signed a new agreement to expand and upgrade the hospital and how I hope the work will be achieved as soon as possible to meet the patriotic needs in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm happy that uh, this project is mentioned as one of the uh, many uh, emblematic projects in this country. And since we're talking about uh, health, we have to talk about the other arm, which is education of improvement of the population, service for the population. And I was very happy to hear about the inauguration of the Japanese University in Egypt a couple of years ago, maybe four, four years or five years back, and this Japanese University of High Technology in the region of uh, North Coast, near Alexandria, which taking a very important point is that you're not building it in Cairo, you're not building it in Alexandria, but on the outskirts of Alexandria, making it a unique place of uh, urbanization of the desert and working there hand in hand with the young population of Egypt. Tell us about this uh, mega project, the Japanese University, please. So education a, a has always been a, a, a core of uh, uh, Japanese international cooperation, as we believe ourselves that human resource development is the most important uh, resource for the development. And about the uh, university, what we call EJUST, uh, Egypt Japan University of Science, Science and Technology officially began in 2010 and it aims at uh, establishing a top class science and technology university which is research oriented, pragmatic and meeting the international standards uti utilizing the model of Japanese engineering postgraduate universities and uh, it's constantly developing and uh, it is the e just is already number one in Egypt in terms of number of thesis uh, per researchers and this is a real partnership uh, between Japan and Egypt for example the Dean is an Egyptian uh, Dr. Gohari but there are two vice deans from Japan and as many as 13 Japanese university is supporting e just and uh, from now, uh, EJUST will receive uh, 150 African students in three years. 
So EJAS is not only a uh, uh, science and technology center in Egypt, but it is going to be a hub uh, of cooperation in science and technology in Africa. So uh, this is a very good example of uh, uh, cooperation in Egypt. Uh, the road has not been very simple, but uh, this is the right way. <coughs> and now, as you know, uh, we are embarking upon another big uh, project on, in education, which is the Egyptian Japanese School, yes. who are the so-called uh, Japanese-style education introduced in um, primary and secondary uh, schools in, in Egypt. Uh, we already have as many as 50 schools uh, which introduced uh, Japanese-style education. Uh, we have been uh, cooperating, uh, offering a significant uh, technical cooperation to uh, apply uh, with Egyptian uh, particularity uh, the, the idea of uh, whole character building of children, not only to uh, give information data, to let them memorize, but to develop the uh, problem-solving capacity and also to, to develop uh, the moral uh, and discipline and the spirit of consultation, uh, cooperation, and also a sound uh, physical capacity. Of course, since we're talking about education, we have to refer uh, to the link between the, the East and the West, which was the Salam Bridge which on, the, on the Suez Canal, very symbolic and very uh, important for urbanization of Sinai and improving of, uh, of the, the civilization of this beautiful part of Egypt. But before we finish the program, we have to talk about the mega project, the project that is so dear uh, to the Egyptians and to the Egyptian president and also to the Japanese authorities, which is the Grand Egyptian Museum. The Grand Egyptian Museum is uh, uh, emphasized and strengthened by the Japanese uh, connection and the Japanese-Egyptian relation. And as I discussed once with the minister, it's not just a, a sort of putting down the, the, uh, the antiques, but it's uh, a restoration uh, institute. It is a technological way of uh, show, uh, showroom with full uh, uh, inter, uh, intermingling between the visitors and the tourists and uh, reaching a very high and skillful educational and entertaining uh, visit. Tell us about this mega project, sir. Mm. Yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm very much excited about this uh, project. But uh, first of all, again, uh, it was a very challenging project for us because uh, uh, we had to extend a, a soft loan of as much as uh, about 800 million US dollars. Again, in the area of culture, it was again unprecedented for you know, cultural <laughs> cooperation. <laughs> uh, but the uh, work is uh, advancing uh, uh, seriously and we are all uh, waiting for the grand opening, uh, hopefully, uh, well, uh, I would believe, a, before the end of this year. Uh, and I would believe it will be a great occasion uh, to demonstrate uh, the, the greatness of the Egyptian civilization. Uh, it's a gift to the world civilization, and it's an occasion to highlight the Japan and uh, uh, Egypt uh, friendship and partnership. Uh, so it's not about the the building itself is uh, very inventive, uh, lots of uh, symbols of, of pyramids and uh, Egyptian civilization, but the inside interior is also important, uh, so that uh, visitors will be able to appreciate the Egyptian civilization uh, in an understandable manner, utilizing high technology as you as you rightly mentioned. I understand that there will be a two big parts. One is the extensive exposition of the treasures of Tutankhamen, and a, 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 another is the uh, organized and comprehensive presentation of the 3,000 years of pharaonic era, according to uh, the, the years and according to different themes. And uh, 
uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, method is to utilize the uh, high-tech high uh, audiovisual and uh, we are developing in Japan so-called 8K technology which it shows the world uh, in a starkling uh, different manner so real and so impressive so uh, this is one of the technology uh, that is being used already in the process of recording uh, memorizing the process of the cooperation and uh, I hope uh, these fruits will be shared by the Egyptian public and international visitors and there are a number of ways well uh, still it's under uh, preparation so uh, uh, you, you will know uh, at uh, an appropriate time uh, best, in the best way to appreciate this great civilization. Sir, so it's been a great pleasure to have you with us. But I know that we wanted also to discuss the Olympics, but we ran out of time. But it's a very memorable idea to have 56 years later, not only uh, the Olympics are back to, uh, to Tokyo, it was a great surprise for the whole world in 1964 mm -hmm. to see how Japan has raised itself from the rubbles, building a country that is so model, uh, modern at that time and even having uh, the train which is, was magnificently fast at that time and how the Tokyo uh, Olympics was very popular and very highly organized. So this year, in 2020, we are seeing a highly advanced uh, Tokyo 2020. If you can just tell us just in a second or two, <laughs> anything about the yes. Japanese uh, prospect about uh, Tokyo tw 2020, sir? So, uh, the uh, Olympic begins uh, 24th uh, July and uh, uh, until uh, the Paralympic uh, in, in September. Uh, we are eager to uh, receive lots of uh, top class, uh, talented sports uh, men and women, including from Egypt football, judo, mm. karate, wrestling, weightlifting, yes. whatever, and I am eager to support with Egyptians together, the Japan and Egypt together. Thank you very much, sir, for <laughs> such a, a beautiful end of, uh, of our program today, World of Info, with His Excellency Ambassador Noki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan in Cairo. Would you promise us one thing before you leave, sir, to come back again to tell us more? about Japan and Egypt. <laughs> of course. <laughs> In time. <laughs> thank, you, yes, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. And by this we come to the end of Word of Info with His Excellency Ambassador Inoki Masaki, Ambassador of Japan and Egypt, Dr. Amru Mabrouk, Professor of Plastic Surgery at Ain Shams University, Dr. Muhammad at the Control, Amnajla Naguib. See you next Thursday, same time, same station, FM 95. .4.